Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman, and this is the Insonic SQ80 synthesizer. An SQ80 voice consists of three digital oscillators. Each oscillator can play a single cycle waveform, a repeated multi cycle waveform, or a transient attack sample. There is also a bunch of drum samples you can use. I found this fantastic Dalsimu website that talks about the various SQ80 waveforms. I thought it would be interesting to explore the original ROM data, and I did find this forum post that included a link to the waveform data that's nicely formatted, and this is the only place that I've managed to find that link. Here is Rainer's actual Insonic website, and the link to those files must be here somewhere, but I can't seem to find it. Anyway, I'll leave the link in the description below. So Arturia's emulation will show you time domain plots of the waveforms, but time domain plots don't always provide an intuitive mechanism of sound design. It is often more intuitive to visualize waveforms in the frequency domain. For instance, on a synclavier, you don't specify single cycle waveforms by drawing them in the time domain. You specify the amplitudes and phases of their harmonics. So I wrote a MATLAB script to do a spectral analysis on all of these single cycle waveforms in that file that Rainer created. In the upper left hand corner, you'll see the original time domain plot of the signal. In the lower left corner, you'll see all of the harmonic magnitudes going all the way out. Now, this can be kind of bunched up and difficult to interpret, so somewhat arbitrarily, I said that I would consider that the maximum harmonic number that's meaningful is the harmonic number for which its magnitude is greater than half of a percent of the maximum amplitude out of all of the harmonics. Here in the upper right, I'm showing what that max harmonic number is. So that half of a percent is somewhat arbitrary, so you should take this with a grain of salt. The harmonic magnitudes are plotted in the upper right, and the harmonic phases are plotted in the lower right. If you look at the vertical axis here, you'll see I'm dividing all of the phases by pi. And I should mention that this phase is in terms of a cosine basis. You can, of course, shift this by pi over 2 as needed to write this in terms of a sine basis. This slide was prepared by my colleagues Jim McClellan and Ron Schaefer as part of the DSP First curriculum that we use at Georgia Tech, and I highly recommend you check out the DSP First website. I created a GitHub repository called SQ80 Analysis. It includes both my analysis code and a zip file containing PDF documents that have the various plots for all of the waveforms. I'll include a link to this repository in the description below. Rainer's SQ80 raw waves zip file contains a readme file that explains the multi-sample structure of the waveforms in the SQ80. Here you can see various MIDI note numbers mapping to different samples. And I should note that it's not like every waveform that you use actually has a separate waveform 1, waveform 2, waveform 3, waveform 4, as shown here. Quite often, one particular sample will apply over a wider range. The real meat is this directory called the waves. So you can take my SQ80 waveproc.m file and place it in the waves folder. And if you run that from Octave from the waves directory, it will actually go into all of these various folders and analyze all the waveforms therein. So each waveform corresponds to a particular multi-sample. Here's my PDF output for that Bell 2 multi-sample. If we look at the waveform for the lower notes, You'll see it looks like this was artificially constructed through additive synthesis of a sparse set of sinusoids. And if we look at the waveform for the higher sample, we'll see it's basically the set of the first four sinusoids for that. So they're leaving out the higher frequencies to avoid aliasing. Let's listen to that waveform. Let's go a couple of octaves up. Ah, there you can see the split point. Now I believe something like the piano is very different. This is a real multi-sample from an actual acoustic instrument.
And if you look at the magnitudes of the harmonics of the lowest frequency waveform, you'll see that they look very different than the waveform above it and the waveform above that. So there in Sonic is trying to capture the way the timbre of an instrument changes over its range, and they're not just chopping off higher-end harmonics in order to avoid aliasing. This is in contrast with the sawtooth waveform that does exactly that. You can see these little Gibbs phenomena wiggles coming in as it's dropping out harmonics to avoid aliasing. And while we're on the topic of classic analog waveforms, notice something interesting about this so-called triangle wave. It's really just the fundamental and the third harmonic, nothing else. Let's take a look at sample number five in the pulse multi-sample. Now, notice all of the harmonic amplitudes going out to number 28 here are the same. So that's going to sound like an impulse train. And it would look like an impulse train if the phases would all line up. However, notice they've scrambled up the phases a bit, so all the sinusoids have shifted around, so their peaks don't all land in the same spot in the waveform. So that basically distributes the information over time. And essentially, you can think of this as giving you like a better overall signal-to-noise ratio. Here in waveform number 6, we drop down to 11 harmonics, and in waveform number 7, we drop down to 7 harmonics. Now, I think something might have gotten confused in the extraction of the waveforms for the lower pulse waveforms, because these amplitudes you see here aren't all the same. Same here, same here, same here. So I'm not sure what's going on here. If you have any insight, let me know. I can't really interpret this as being a pulse waveform. So let's talk a little bit about the code, which you can download and adapt to your own purposes. The first thing you'll find in the code is just this list of file names. Here I'm using curly brackets, so this is a solo array in MATLAB, and I need that so the entries can be strings. And this is just all of the paths to the various waveforms. And you'll see that it's a lot of file names. And yeah, I did this all by hand. So let's scroll down a little bit more, scroll down a little bit more, scroll down a little bit more. I open up a figure, and then I loop through all of those file names. I read in the file, get the length of the file, assign that to n, and then I take the fast Fourier transform. Now remember, the fast Fourier transform isn't really its own thing. It's an algorithm for computing a discrete Fourier transform. The usual discrete Fourier transform is defined in terms of a complex sinusoid basis, and it can be applied to complex-valued signals. There's a 1 over n that shows up in the transform, and it usually winds up showing up like this. You usually don't have an n to the left of the summation in the DFT, but you will have a 1 over n that shows up in the inverse discrete Fourier transform. But that's just a convention. You could put the 1 over n wherever you want. And I've seen some textbooks, particularly ones that emphasize a linear algebra approach to signal processing, that will sometimes split the difference. They'll put a 1 over square root of n over here and a 1 over square root of n over here. The net effect of that convention is that if I really want to write things in terms of Fourier series coefficients, to get the Fourier series coefficients, I need to take the result of my FFT and divide by n. So that's why I'm taking the result of my FFT and dividing it by n here to get my actual harmonics. Now, the first element in my FFT array is actually going to be the DC value of the waveform, which should be zero, so I skip that. So by starting from the index two here, I'm actually pulling out the fundamental. Now notice for my endpoint, I don't go all the way up to n. I go up to n divided by two. Because my waveform is real valued in this case, the spectrum has conjugate symmetry. So all of the values of the DFT that are higher than that n over two are redundant. Here I do that business of figuring out what basically the highest important harmonic is. And I do that by just creating a vector that goes one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. And then I eliminate any of the entries that are below the threshold. And then I ask, what's the biggest number in that list? 
a few little tidbits about making plots. I found that if I didn't include this interpreter nun business here, then when I was trying to make the titles, it would take underscores in the file names and interpret that as indicating subscripts. So this fixed that. And by using this interpreter tech here, I was actually able to use the Greek letter pi here. Anyway, you can download this code, and once you have these harmonics, you can do other things with them. If you're able to discover something interesting by looking at my plots, or you do something interesting using my code, please leave a comment below. Let me know what you're up to. You could potentially, for instance, use this kind of work to implement these waveforms in a seclavier. I'll also mention that you can get the full set of slides for the various slides that I showed from the DSP First website, which I highly recommend that you check out.